Some of you may have heard of Lucille Rickson, but for those of you who have not, please take a look at this photograph. How old do you think Lucille is here? 18? 20? Perhaps even 22? Lucille Rickson was 14 when she died. This photo is reflective of a child who was used and abused by the studio system and perhaps by the one person who should have protected her, her mother. The following story of her short life may not be comfortable for some, but it is a reminder of the sad system that still exists even today. A system that takes advantage of the young and innocent. Usually now through reality TV, where sadly we will still find examples of parents that exploit their children for fame and fortune. Lucille's life started out innocently enough. Born Ingborg Myrtle Elizabeth on August 22, 1910 in Chicago, Illinois. To parents who immigrated from Denmark. Her father, Soren Eriksson, sometimes known as Samuel, and her mother, Marin Johanna Ingeborg Nelson. Lucille would be their second child as they had a son named Marshall Edward, born on December 19, 1907. When Lucille was still a baby, her mother Marin decided to enroll her in modeling. Lucille was a cute little girl with an adorable smile, and the camera loved her. Marin then had Marshall enroll in modeling as well. Then she had the idea of getting her children into acting. As Lucille started getting a little older, her mother fashioned her hair into cute little ringlets, which even got her more attention. Soon both children at a young age were subjected to grueling work schedules that would exhaust most adult models. But Marin's dream would soon come true the dream of seeing one of her children on screen. For Lucille would appear in her first film at the tender age of five in The Millionaire Baby, released in 1915. It was also around this time that Lucille's modeling got a bit disturbing. With her mother's acceptance, photographers had Lucille at the age of five pose for nudes. Some of these photos, which I refuse to show on this platform, they tried to get her to pose more provocatively like the much, much older female models. Why would her mother allow this? Sadly, many think it was to advance Lucille's career and for cold, hard cash. When Lucille turned eight, her mother Marin made a decision that would cause even more trauma for Lucille and her brother. Most of Marin's time was concentrating on her children's careers, so she had little to no time for family life or her husband. And instead of scaling back on the grueling work schedules of her children, she decided to divorce Samuel instead and packed up her children to move to Hollywood, then known as Hollywoodland. She was determined that one of her children would become famous. By some accounts, Marin was one of the first obsessive stage mothers, but sadly as we still see examples today, not the last. When they arrived in Hollywood, Marin changed her daughter's name to Lucille Rickson. Lucille continued her modeling and eventually caught the eye of famed producer Samuel Goldwyn. He cast her in a series of short films based on the adventures of Edgar Pomeroy, starring Edward Peel Jr., then known as Johnny Jones. In one of these shorts, Lucille got to play alongside her brother Marshall in 1920's Edgar's Jonah Day. But sadly, that film doesn't exist anymore. Marin, seeing that Lucille was the more profitable child, put her full efforts into her. Marshall would only be credited for one other role in 1921's The Old Nest, where he also appeared with his little sister. The Old Nest was written by Rupert Hughes, uncle to Howard Hughes, and also starred Mary Alden, Colin Landis, and Helene Chadwick. After this movie was filmed, Marshall spent less of his time acting and modeling and instead concentrated on his studies and going to school. After The Old Nest, Lucille would appear in 
The Child Thou Gavest Me, released in August of 1921. The studio promoted Lucille in advertising, and soon she was going on tours and meeting fans alongside the other celebrities. Marin was happy with her daughter's success, but some questioned if Lucille was happy. Her interaction with the fans, especially with the children, did seem sincere, and she did look happy. After all, she was still a child herself. She even started a scrapbook of her various magazine and newspaper articles which she appeared, photos with her fellow co-stars, flyers and posters of her movies. She wanted to document her career, so she did seem happy with her success, but was that to last? In 1922, the studio decided to cut the long ringlets out of her hair to change her image and to steer her into a more disturbing direction on screen. They wanted her to appear more mature, but we have to remember that in 1922, Lucille was still 12 years of age. In 1922, she got to star alongside one of the rising stars of the day, Canadian-born Marie Prevost in The Married Flapper. This movie would be yet another step up in her career by signing a contract with director and actor Marshall Nealon. He cast her in the critically successful drama The Stranger's Banquet, where she starred alongside Claire Windsor. Her next film that year would be called Forsaking All Others, starring none other than Colleen Moore. In 1923, they had her appear in a very controversial movie called Human Wreckage, about drug addiction, also starring Bessie Love. The movie was produced by actress Dorothy Davenport, who made the film after she lost her husband, silent movie star Wallace Reed, from morphine addiction. She was next cast opposite of Conrad Nagel in The Rendezvous in 1923. She was 13, he was 26. Next, she appeared in Judgment of the Storm opposite of Lloyd Hughes, who also was 26. At the age of 13, the studio was trying to turn her into their next leading lady. The question is, why? The studio and their publicity departments even started calling her the newest leading lady. The Covington Republic newspaper called her the youngest leading lady on the screen and even mentioned her real age. The studio then had to go into damage control mode and started to take out advertisements in newspapers and movie magazines to state that she was 17. So somewhere in the studio system, someone knew to cast a 12 to 13 year old as a romantic leading lady was wrong. So why did they do it in the first place? They cast her in roles such as jealous girlfriends or even jealous wives, opposite of much, much older male co-stars. Yet the damage control by the studio seemed to work, and the public started to believe she was 16 or 17, and her star rose even further. The studio and her agents ordered if there were any promo photos of Lucille to be released, she had to look much, much more mature. So they dressed her in the latest fashions, including high heels and with the latest hairstyles. In some promos, she was depicted with bare shoulders or even a bare back. Starring in roles that should have been given to much older actresses due to the storylines, started to affect Lucille mentally, as she was still just an innocent child thrown into adulthood in adult situations on screen by the studios with the full acceptance of her mother. Those adult situations on screen sadly would not stay there, as this confused young girl was put into situations she was not prepared to handle. At 13, she started going through puberty and started falling in love with her much older co-stars. Rumor has it that disturbingly enough, some of her feelings may have been returned by some of her much older male co-stars. One such co-star was Sid Chaplin, half-brother to Charlie Chaplin, who appeared with her in the movie The Rendezvous in 1923. 
Many around them thought they had started dating secretly because of the affection they showed each other on the set. Remember, she was 13. He was 38. These rumors eventually hit the press, and Billboard made an announcement that the two had actually secretly married in the fall of 1923. Neither Sid nor Lucille came forth to say the story was true or not, and the studio didn't comment either. A marriage certificate was never produced to show that this was nothing but a rumor to sell magazines, because a marriage certificate didn't exist. There is no real proof that they dated either, but somewhere from someone these rumors were started. And even if there is no proof that they dated, there is still no doubt they did show affection towards each other. The demand on Lucille kept increasing, and she was offered more contracts to appear in more films, still portraying roles that much older actresses should have been cast in. She was exhausted, working long hours that didn't seem to end. But the studios wanted her to work, and Lucille felt obligated to those commitments, and no doubt her mother was possibly behind her pushing her to do more and more roles. Her agents certainly were. In 1924, the Western Association of Motion Picture Advertisers, or WAMPAS for short, awarded Lucille and 12 other actresses an award they gave out every year that honored young female stars. Ironically, the name of the award was called the Baby Stars, named such as it wasn't really meant so far to be awarded to children, but to those actresses who were on the verge of stardom. To put it into perspective, when Lucille received that award, she had just turned 14. Another actress who received that award that year was none other than the IT girl, Clara Bow, but she was 19. 1924 would also be the year Lucille's exhausting work schedule would catch up to her. She was filming the comedy The Galloping Fish, co-starring Sid Chaplin, when her health first showed signs that something might seriously be wrong. She appeared malnourished, and started to get sick on set. But she was committed by the studios to work 10 films in seven months. That year, while working on the film The Denial, which was later released in 1925, she collapsed on set. Not only exhausted, but she was diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis and confined to a bed, although this was not initially told to the public. Her mother, finally showing concern for her daughter, never left her bedside. Marin banned the press, most of the studio representatives, actors, and even her co-stars that she appeared with from coming to see her until she was feeling better. However, she did allow at least two people to come visit her daughter. One was film director Paul Byrne, who would sit and read to Lucille. The other was actress and best friend to Lucille, Lois Wilson. The one other person that was always found at her bedside was her brother Marshall, who had to quit school to find work to help support his mother and sister, seeing as his sister no longer had an income. Lucille's fragile body was finally getting the rest it desperately needed, but sadly, she would never recover. The few visitors she was allowed she would smile and try to make everyone happy in the room when she was able, but her energy was draining. Her doctor, J.F. McKittrick, finally released a statement to the press on Lucille's health, and here is that statement. She crowded too much work into too short of a time and overtaxed her capacities. Other youthful stars have done the same thing. The result is that she has had a complete physical and nervous collapse, so complete that she has not rallied from it as she should. Early in 1925, on February 21st, a Saturday, while standing by Lucille's bedside and fixing her covers, Marin suddenly collapsed and fell on top of Lucille on her bed. 
Lucille screamed and Marshall came running into the room and he tried to pick up his mother off his sister. It is said that Marin then whispered to Marshall, Take care of yourself, dear. Then she closed her eyes and would never wake up again. She died right there of a heart attack. And if reports are true, right on top of Lucille in her son's arms. Marin died a few days before her 45th birthday. While doing research, I found this news clipping from Los Angeles on Marin's death, which explains a bit of the situation. Los Angeles, California, February 23rd. Lucille Rickson, 15-year-old leading woman of the movies, the little blonde actress who stepped at the age of 13 from 8-year-old child roles to 20-year-old sophisticated roles, lay on her sickbed today amid the ashes of a Hollywood success. Minutes during to her in rooms of the half bungalow which have gradually become bearer in the five months of her illness was her grieving 17-year-old brother Marshall, a clear-faced stripling who quit high school when things began to go bad in the little family of three. But the little family was reduced to two Saturday when Mrs. Ingeborg Rickson, who nursed and attended her daughter through every hour of five months of distress, paid the fatal toll of overwork and overstrain and collapsed, dying on her daughter's bed. Yesterday, the body of the mother lay unattended in a funeral parlor without a flower from friends of lively days. Now I have to pause and think that this is quite ironic that they mention it was overstrain and overwork that made Marin collapse. When Lucille's own doctor even mentioned the same thing put Lucille in her sickbed something that her own mother could have helped prevent. Lucille suffered a huge shock, which damaged her already ailing body and mind. Actress Lois Wilson and Marshall kept vigil by her bedside. Paul Byrne ordered around-the-clock nurses to take care of her. It was then, after their mother had died, their father suddenly reappeared to offer his support. But Lucille, who was somewhat still conscious, and her brother wanted nothing to do with him. You see, when Marin left her husband, her husband technically left his own children. It is said he never made an attempt to reconnect with them. He wanted to get custody of his children, and some think it's because Lucille may have had a little bit of money left at least for the insurance after she died. Instead, the children asked actor Conrad Nagel and Rupert Hughes to become their guardians. Samuel tried to fight it even in court, but in the end, the children's wishes were respected. Lucille fell into a coma which she would never awaken. And on March 13, 1925, with her brother and Lois Wilson by her side, Lucille passed away. Her death certificate stated she died of pulmonary tuberculosis, but that didn't stop the horrible rumors. One such rumor going around said that Lucille died from complications from, let's say, a terminated pregnancy, which there is no proof of and there was never any proof she was even pregnant. These rumors were more than likely fueled by the fact she was an innocent child thrust into adulthood at the tender age of 12 to live in the spotlight by both the studios and her mother, and the fact that she was maybe falling in love with her much older male co-stars. And those rumors surrounding her possible interactions and marriage with 38-year-old Sid Chaplin didn't help either. But then again, Hollywood and the press love their rumors. It can sell both magazines and tickets to the movies. Some newspapers reported she died from a broken heart from seeing her mother pass away, which might have been just studio spin. But others were closer to the truth. Reporting on her horrible work schedule, she was pushed into most of her short life and that her body and mind just couldn't keep up with that schedule. Some even called out her agents and her mother as factors in her death. 
What we must remember is Lucille may have seemed to be an adult in some of her roles, but she never made it to adulthood herself. She would never even see her sweet 16. She passed away five months before her 15th birthday. She was subjected to a work schedule that would cause most adult stars to collapse by the studios, her agents, and sadly, even her mother. And still being a child who seemed to want to please everyone around her, perhaps she never found her voice to speak up against it. It seems she felt the need to always look and act happy, to make everyone around her happy, and she never wanted to disappoint anyone, especially her mother. A child that never really had a childhood because those around her saw an opportunity and took advantage of her success for their own gain. A child that was made to become a woman at such a young age on screen and sadly perhaps off screen. Someone who should have been protected by the one person she should have been able to count on, her mother. So why did Marin, her mother, keep that vigil by her bedside until her heart gave out? Did she look down at her daughter in that bed and realize that she may have at least been partially responsible for her daughter's illness? That by exposing her to hard work schedules and adult situations put her in that bed when as a mother she was supposed to prevent this? Was it maybe guilt and the stress from that guilt that was too much for her heart? It may have been just bad timing of a possible undiagnosed heart disease that caught up with her and maybe the stress. We will never know, but one thing is for sure. Many, many people in Lucille's life failed her. Yet after all that hard work, the grueling work schedules, the pushing from her mothers, the agents, the studios, and forced to grow up at the tender age of 12 and basically being worked to the grave, after all that, Sadly, much of Lucille's work on film is lost. Lucille was cremated along with her mother and their remains share an urn at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale. You may ask, well, what happened to Marshall, her brother? He never went back to modeling or acting. And under his new guardians, Conrad Nagel and Rupert Hughes, he enrolled in the University of California where he majored in law and grew up to be a very successful lawyer in San Francisco. He married and even his sons, twins, also grew up to be successful attorneys. But it is said that Marshall never ever talked about his sister or the past as those memories were too much for him to bear. <laughs>